Since 2003, this is the Sports Source. East Tennessee's number one sports talk show. Presented by Hyperwrench, and by Junk Be Gone, and by the Garza Law Firm. With your host, John Pennington. The Sports Source starts now. Good Sunday morning. Welcome into the Junk Beyond Studios for the Sports Source. As you can see, I'm not John Pennington. I'm Josh Ward. In for John today. John is away this weekend. He'll be back next Sunday. In the meantime, for the next 90 minutes, we will do our best not to screw things up, at least too badly. Luckily, we have a great group that will help with that along the way. We also have a ton to discuss on today's show. Tennessee's basketball team went 2-0 this week. Another blowout win at home Saturday night against Texas A&M. We'll talk about what that does for Tennessee now moving into the final two weeks of the regular season. The next week will include Bruce Pearl and the Auburn Tigers coming to town. So we will discuss the upcoming matchup at home, the Vols against Auburn. We'll talk about Tennessee on the basketball court. We'll talk about Tennessee in the courtroom. Tennessee gets a win on Friday against the NCAA. We will cover that from a Tennessee perspective as well as big picture, a look around college football and into the future. Tennessee football lands two assistant coaches to join Josh Heupel's staff, and we can't talk Tennessee-Auburn without a Cavalaris line. We will have that before the show ends. As you can tell, we are loaded up, so let's dive right in to today's show with the first segment brought to you by the Garza Law Firm. When you're in need of a quality attorney, turn to a local attorney, a proven and trusted attorney, and that means turn to Marcos Garza and the Garza Law Firm. I had a friend this week tell me how much he appreciates and respects Marcos Garza for the way that he does his job. Visit GarzaLaw.com to learn more about an East Tennessee native who's proud to be a part of our community. Garza Law. Let's begin the show welcoming the first set of panelists for the next 90 minutes. To my right, Jimmy Himes and Will West. Guys, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. To my left, Mark Pankratz, former Division I basketball player, staff member at the University of Tennessee. Mark, good to see you. Good to see you and uh, bringing together the Sports Animal Collection <laughs> on the show. It's a takeover. That's guys. right. Vince Farrar, good to see you as well. <laughs> Thank you to see you, Josh. Guys, uh, blowout win against Texas A&M last night for Tennessee. First half competitive for a little while, and then the second half it was all Tennessee. The Vols dominated with an 86-51 to win. Two weeks ago in a loss at Texas A&M, A&M dominated the boards. Last night, Tennessee out-rebounded A&M 50-33. to Zakai Ziegler, I thought he was masterful in the way that he played. He had 14 assists. Four steals, he was one point and one rebound away from a triple-double in the performance. A ho-hum, 24 points from Dalton Connect. And then Jonas Adu, 18 points, 14 rebounds. And it puts Tennessee in a position. They're tied, tied now atop the SEC standings after Kentucky beat uh, Alabama yesterday afternoon. Mark Pankratz, thoughts on the win? What do you take away from that performance from Tennessee? Well, my, my first takeaway was our, our urgency, our, our attention to detail just seemed better. Yes, yes, we made shots. We're going to talk about the players and their step-up. But just when you go to that Missouri game, you even look at some of the games we lost to Texas a and the first time, our urgency, our attention to detail, our energy just seemed different last night, and uh, that showed. I mean, with the way that Jonas played, uh, the way that uh, Zakai was able to get into spots and, and make decisions and pass the ball, uh, probably the best 3-for-10 performance that, that you'll see <laughs> because of what he did on the court, um, but, but our energy just seemed to be one of, of hey, we're the better team, and we're going to put our, our foot on the gas from the start. Regardless if you make some early threes, we're going to do what we do. And, and they, just, they just buried them. And because of that urgency, when A&M kind of got their footing a little bit in that first half, took a short lead, Tennessee had a response. Like, they didn't panic. They didn't lose their poise. Like, I thought they did. And even Zakai Ziegler admitted he got a little rattled in the Missouri game. But because they had that urgency, they were able to get it back and then separate. I thought the way they defended the drive was incredibly improved over what we saw against a and They killed Tennessee with the drive. Tennessee was outstanding defensively. It set the tone for everything else. I think. And they didn't get beat on the boards, right? That's mm-hmm. the biggest yeah. thing is they, they, they took the fight to a and when it comes to they boxed out. Because you could tell in that first matchup, A&M's already, the shot's going up. A&M's already breaking to where they need to be to box out. And Tennessee shut them down from that standpoint, and I thought that was a big game changer. I would also say one thing I love that Tennessee did – they shot around the season average beyond the arc, but still beat a team down like this. And sometimes when they're not shooting as well, I think 
there's a level of panic that's there. And maybe there isn't the same attention to detail when the outside shot's not falling. And I thought last night they had that attention to detail even when it wasn't a 41% shooting night by beyond the arc. I thought a big thing, and, and, and y'all have touched on a lot, but something that Vince mentioned, the two guards for A&M, Taylor and Radford, they combined for 52 points when they beat Tennessee in College Station two weeks ago. They were 11 of 14 on threes. They combined for 22 points. They were 5 of 19 on threes. And Taylor, who hit, he hit three threes real early, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, here he goes again. After his third three, he didn't score again for 31 minutes. They did a heck of a job shutting him down. So I thought a big key, among other things, was, was shutting down those two guards that really killed them when they played at A&M earlier. Jimmy, to your point, Taylor started shooting three of four. He made three of his first mm -hmm. four threes. The rest of the way, A&M as a team, four of 30. And Buzz Williams was talking about how they shot way too many threes in that game. Mm -hmm. And he was asked if Tennessee baited him. He's like, well... If they baited us, we took the bait. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that, that worked in Tennessee's favor because they're not a high percentage three-point yeah. shooting team. Well, the, the bait was we got into gaps better. Meshack got more playing time, which he is our best on-ball yeah. defender. Mm -hmm. um, and Zakai, the way that he – the stats, the assists, the rebounds, all that stuff. But the way that he impacts the game with his ball pressure, full court, it, it makes a difference. It makes the, the other team's offense start further off the three-point line. Now, even if they get into gaps – they're getting in gaps above the free throw line, so now you're kicking out deeper threes. So Zakai, his fingerprints were all over that game, despite besides just the assists and rebounds, just a, a phenomenal performance. In the second half, I thought the spacing was fantastic on the other end as well. I thought, I mean, how many times did you see three A&M players kind of just standing in the paint, not knowing where to go? Tennessee works the ball on the perimeter. They start breaking to the guy who has the ball or the open shooters, ball back inside to and to Taidu. They do with an open dunk. I mean, that just kept happening it over and over again because of the great mm -hmm. spacing that Tennessee had. And, and Buzz Williams was very impressed with Ziegler. He mm -hmm. complimented him. He called him the engine. He called him the conduit to what they do on offense and defense. He called him underrated. And then he used the big word. He called him unheralded. <laughs> and the guy said, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it means you're really good. But, uh, yeah, Williams was really impressed with what, uh, what Ziegler did. And I, I thought – as mentioned earlier, even though he was 3 of 10, I thought he had a fabulous game. Yeah, both ends of the floor. And um, Adu is a guy that we've talked about on the mm -hmm. show, attack the rim. Uh, he, he has seemed to do that last night and in the win against Missouri, cleaning up as well. Mark, what, what difference does that make when Adu has that mindset and then is, of course, able to make those plays too? Yeah, being more aggressive, I think it, it carries over to what Will talked about is his rebounding too. When he's got that more aggressive mindset, it carries over to the ball screen defense. You heard Barnes talk about in the post game that their ball screen defense, this time of the year, you got to be able to defend ball screens. So the aggressive mm -hmm. mentality is not just finishing at the rim with the dunks um, that Adu gives you. It, it transitions down to the other aspects of his performance. And it's nice knowing that you got Tobe, who's are starting to turn the corner a little mm -hmm. bit, that you can get a rest and you're not falling off as much on that interior position, it, it makes the depth that much more important. Well, I love that Barnes went back to that big lineup, which mm -hmm. obviously worked in helping them get out of the hole against Missouri. And you even saw it with Estrella for a couple of minutes with Adu. So as he continues to get healthier, you, you could see that for energy. So I, I think there's so much versatility on this team. It's incredibly impressive. You know, it's funny, that loss at Texas A&M two weeks ago, that was not a good showing, right? It was an ugly performance. Mm -hmm. Since then, A&M has not won a game. Yeah. Tennessee's won out since then, and against some weaker competition along the way, but they've also blown out a lot of that competition. The, the worst showing would have been first half at Missouri, where there's probably sleep at the wheel at the start, and then they turn it on in the second half. So we'll see maybe over the next two weeks, but that A&M loss might have been the lesson Tennessee needed, and Texas A&M now has, has played its way out, but... Jonas and Tobey, the conversations we're having about them right now is what we'll be talking about in the postseason of what they need because they're going to face tough physical front court competition again in the NCAA tournament. And they had trouble against that earlier with Purdue right. or whether it was Kansas or North Carolina. They, they've, had, they've struggled with that. And so that combination might help them against uh, teams that have an imposing center that can score. Well, to tee up to the next segment, we got that can come in with, with Auburn, you know, with what Broom's got. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're yeah. coming. These next opponents – they're all coming. Mm -hmm. Four yep. straight quad ones. Yeah. Yes. Tennessee is about to play a road to the Final Four. The next two weeks will be <laughs> Auburn, Alabama, South Carolina, and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. You don't get mm -hmm. that in the four games required to get to the Final Four. <laughs> yep. So we'll come back and discuss Tennessee's next matchup. You know Bruce Pearl. You know about his teams. How does this team that he's bringing to town this week for the Auburn Tigers compare to what we typically see from a Bruce Pearl team? That's next.
Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by A.G. Hines Company. For more than 100 years, A.G. Hines Company has been supplying East Tennesseans with the best building material and tools at the very best prices. Plus, you get a century's worth of experience when it comes to advice and answered questions. They've figured out a lot in 100 plus years at A.G. Hines Company. Back this segment with Jimmy, Will, and Mark. So Tennessee turns to the final two weeks trying to win an SEC regular season championship, trying to go for a one seed in the NCAA tournament. It's never been done. And we'll start out that process against former Tennessee basketball coach Bruce Pearl and the Auburn Tigers, one of the top contenders in the SEC as well. Mark, we've seen a lot of Bruce Pearl basketball, you especially. What have you seen from this Bruce Pearl team? How does this team, what Auburn does, compare to what we – typically see from a Bruce Pearl team. Yeah, well, you've heard, heard all season us talk about Tennessee's offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency, the rankings putting them in a chance to win the national championship because the, a team that finishes in the top 25 in both categories have won the national championship. Auburn's one of those teams as well. Yep. They're, they're really good defensively. They're top six or seven defensive teams in the country by, by Ken Pomeroy. Same thing with offense. They're, they're, I think, 22nd in the country in offense. Up, updated numbers, they're top 15 in both categories. So, so um, the, the, they can score the ball. The difference for this team um, is Broom, in, in my opinion. He, he's you know, second in, in rebounding in the league, uh, top 10 in scoring, um, but he, he plays with that, that tenacity, that, that bulldog mentality that we know Bruce Pearl teams have. Um, the thing that is common about Bruce Pearl's teams is the depth. You know, they, they have a, uh, their, de their bench scores 35 points a game, which leads the, the, the conference. So they've got, they're going to bring in waves of guys. Um, they're going to attack downhill like they always do, mix it up. The ball pressure, what they're going to do is they're going to try to ball pressure and wear Zakai Ziegler out. Just wear him down with full court pressure, whether or not, whether or not to get a turnover or to just make him tired so he can't do what he did last night. I think they also, it's weird because in February they shoot fewer threes than they have than any Bruce team we've seen at Auburn, I think, so far. I think 26 is the highest uh, three-point attempt total that they have in the month of February right now, but they hit a lot of them. I think three of the games in February they've hit more than 50% beyond the arc while attempting more than 23s. It does seem like it's a lot about who is going to step up on the bench. Broom's going to get his, Williams is going to get his, and then the other guys, it's almost like the NBA where those are our scores. We're here to stay, you know what I mean, to space the floor and that's and play defense and that's what we do. And then who is it that steps up off of the bench for Auburn? That's going to be a big difference maker. They had a guy the other day that I, I didn't know much about and he got 25. Yeah. Uh, he, had a, he had lost his high school coach and apparently was motivated by that. Auburn's a team that I don't think you want to be tied with with 10 minutes left in a game because, as Mark alluded to, their depth is really good and they keep coming at you. You need to have a lead in that last 10 minutes so they can wear you out. And I think that'll be a key for Tennessee. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, to, to what Mark said, my concern here is Tennessee goes seven or eight deep right now. And you, you, do you feel comfortable if Tennessee, with eight minutes left, like Jimmy said, that Auburn's bench versus Tennessee's depth, who's going to have the fresh legs, who's going to have healthy legs? That's a little bit of a concern that I have for Tennessee coming into this game. And their assist to turnover ratio is really good. My concern is you saw some of it with Ganey last night and with Meshack. If those are your two primary guards coming off the bench right now, neither one are really strong with the basketball and taking care of it. They struggle from the outside at times, whereas, whereas Auburn's guard depth, they are doing things where they're not only knocking down shots, but they're continuing to get guys involved. What about the mindset of a, a Bruce Pearl team? They're coming on the road, so Tennessee will have the home court advantage. I'm sure Bruce will try to play that up as best he can to have his team mentally ready for what they'll face at the oh, Food City Center. Yeah, Pearl is the king of motivation. He'll, yeah. he'll find any way to, to get his guys motivated. I, I was texting with him earlier about a team that they had beat, um, and, and it was something that was said by one of the players last year after the game that he brought up and that he wanted to, to prove that guy wrong. And so he's going to find any, any nook and cranny, any way that he can to, to get his guys motivated. You guys like these are the type of games to close out a regular season? Tennessee just went through a more comfortable stretch in terms of the level of opponent. What do you think? Yeah, I do. Um, I debate this, but I, I think overall it helps prepare you for the NCAA tournament. Uh, the other part of that is, does it wear you down? Right, your legs. So you could argue, you yeah. could argue that both ways, but I, I would, I would prefer to play the really good competition later in the year, and because I think that helps you become tournament tested. I get a little concerned when I first looked at the schedule, and so you just close them with murderers row, right? But 
if you look at that that three game stretch early on in the season where Tennessee plays three top five teams, how much better did they get after that? So can you have a similar effect heading into the SEC tournament because you're playing these four top teams to close out the regular season? This is why I'm not a big SEC tournament guy. I'd rather have you have this four game stretch and then not get all the way to the championship to get an extra couple of days of rest in preparation for the next gauntlet that's coming, which is the NCAA tournament. I think fans have come onto that side too, right? They got the SEC mm-hmm. tournament title a couple years ago. Yeah. So I think most fans' reaction has been, okay, we got it, we're good. Let's focus more on the NCAA tournament, that final four run, which is the big focus right now for Tennessee. So Tennessee, Auburn, we will have more conversation about Bruce Pearl, what he will try to do against Tennessee on both ends of the floor coming up in a couple of segments. When we come back, a big milestone for Rick Barnes. And how many more of these matchups will we see between Bruce Pearl and Rick Barnes? We'll have that next. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Elkmont Station, an ever-changing menu of unique farm-fresh dishes. Craft cocktails you won't find anywhere else in East Tennessee and a comfy, cozy atmosphere just perfect for a meal with family or friends. Elkmont Station offers all that and more. Find out more at ElkmontStationKnox.com. Let's also welcome to the show Bob Hodge, Sports good Source morning. OG. Bob, good to see you. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks for being with us today, and uh, congratulations are also in order. It was a big win for Tennessee against Texas A&M. It was a big milestone for Rick Barnes. His 800th career win, when you look at what he has done over the course of his career as a coach, and a lot of those have now come at the University of Tennessee as well, but he is only the 15th Division I coach with 800 career wins. Tennessee put out a video with a bunch of other great coaches, Mm -hmm. uh, many of them on that list. Roy Williams, Tom Mizzo uh, congratulated him on being a a little bit ahead uh, as well. But uh, Jimmy Himes, 800 career wins for Rick Barnes is a heck of a note. It's a great feat for him. He's had um, 11 25-win seasons. He's about to have his 12th. He's had three 30-win seasons. He's won in different eras. Uh, he's won with different teams. He's won it with superstars. He's won it with players that not many superstars on his team. And he's done it so many different ways. And, and it's impressive to see that he's still going as strong as he is after this many years, like 40 years. He's got, I think, 196 wins at Tennessee in nine years, something like that. So I, I think it's a remarkable achievement for Rick Barnes. Yeah, John, Cal- John Calipari's note in the video was, I've told people if you want to hire somebody to come in, rebuild a program, mm-hmm. and get it where it needs to go, you go get Rick Barnes. That's who you get, and he's done that at Tennessee. Of course, you hit 800 wins, and he's coached as long as he has. The question then becomes, okay, how many more wins does he have in him? How much longer does he want to coach? How many more times will we see Rick versus Bruce Pearl, which we'll see this week? Uh, Vince, what do you think? Rick Barnes, all that he's done. Things have changed a little bit in the world of college sports, mm-hmm. which we'll get to uh, more in just a few minutes. Rick Barnes, what he's done to this point, how much more he might want to coach? Well, I get a chance to watch him at practice an awful lot during the Vol Network pregame interviews, and he has incredible energy during practices. And I don't see any signs of him being so discouraged with the way college athletics has gone or not having that fire in practices, in games. I know there was the narrative of, yeah, he's on the rocking chair tour when he first got here. <laughs> so much for that. Um, and, and to me, he's just as dialed in. The key for him handling the state of college athletics is having the right people around him that can maneuver a lot of those things with the NIL transfer portal. Quick story on that. When I first talked to Rick Barnes after he was hired at Tennessee, I said, does what happened at Texas give you a little bit more fire in your belly? He said, I never lost the fire mm-hmm. in my belly. And that's pretty much Rick Barnes. So just to answer your question, I, I mean, I, I could see him coaching – three, four, five more years. I mean, unless there's a health issue that comes up, you know. Right. I wonder how much of this will be pushed by the fact he hadn't won it all yet. I mean, he's had one Final Four appearance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for all the greatness you come back to, you know, that's the reason a lot of people are saying this is be another Sweet 16 team because, you know, he just doesn't get past that level. So I wonder if that will push him maybe even a little bit longer. That if he's he's close, I mean, he's got a team that can get there. He's got a team that can win it. He's also got a team that can get beat in the Sweet 16 like they have for many times. So I just wonder if the pursuit of a championship or at least another Final Four appearance may not be pushing him down. But to your all's point, too, you watch him in a post-game interview or a pre-game interview, he doesn't seem like a man who's close to saying, ah, I'm about done with this. Mm-hmm. 
My, my, two things on it is, one, uh, you talked about all the wins. I think about there's not been any issues either. You mentioned Caleb Park. Right, and there's yep. been other ones that have won at a high level, but there's been issues with their programs. He's done it at a high level and with tons of character. Two, my hope is he does make a run. And kind of like with what Jay Wright did at Villanova, it's like, man, you know what? I, I could do this a little bit longer, but I'm out. Because the man is so impactful, and he could Im impact people even beyond basketball in different circles of life and not be so burnt out by the game that we don't get to be impacted by the character and the person that he is. So I hope he doesn't go all the way to the tape where he's burnt out. I hope he gets out with some more energy in his belly to be able to go continue to make impact. You just never know from a family standpoint what's going on there that, that might be a priority, you see grandkids, things like that. And, you know, he's he's a, a, a big man of faith. So he just may get that sign that telling him, hey, now is the time, even if you know, there's nothing concrete in front of you. Well, and, and now you've got name, image, and likeness, which and, and the transfer portal, which can make it tougher on coaches. But I think his love of coaching basketball mm. supersedes that. I think that's even more important to him. I think he, I think he loves getting to the arena and just coaching ball every day, which I think could elongate his career. But to Mark's point, maybe there's a point where he says, hey, I've got enough energy to do these other things. It's time to, to move on. And to his credit, this year he's shown that he can adjust because mm -hmm. that was part of the previous right. narrative. Oh, he's setting his way as a mm -hmm. defense. He's adjusted with this basketball team. The, the other piece of it you talked about with the Pearl, you know, how long, how many more matchups are these are we going to see? One of those things that most coaches care about is their legacy and their coaching tree. And so the other question would be is, can he get the program enough to where he's got one of his other coaches in line to where they're, they're looked apart as a candidate that's high enough caliber for this administration to hire one of Rick Barnes' guys? Same thing with Pearl. Pearl wants to have Stephen, his son who's on staff, be the next coach. And so I could see Pearl going until he's got a chance to be able to name his successor and being his son. And so I think there are a lot of different aspects mm -hmm. that can come into play, but I would bet it's going to be about three or four more years where both of them are still going. Did and you see Stephen oh. be Tennessee's replacement for Rick Barnes? <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that'll happen. Okay, <laughs> wanted to make sure. Uh, well, well, to that point, though, what do you think Rick Barnes has done for the job? Uh, the, the end comes at some point. What does the job look like, do you think, to the coaching world with what Rick's done over the however many years that will have been? Oh, the stability uh, now mm -hmm. with what this program has compared to what was nine years ago when you've had the Donnie Tindalls and cons over. It was just kind of churning through it. Not only just churning through coaches, but the issues and the fog around the program. Yeah. I think it's, it's completely changed the trajectory of this program. Bob Hodge, I agree. Did, I, did I cut you off on a point there? A no, ago? no, I, I was just going to say about the Bruce Pearl, how many times are we going to see him, Barnes, that sort of thing. I was just going to agree with what Mark said. I think you've probably got at least three, four, who knows how many more of those. But also to the point, yeah, I think Tennessee now is at a different level on basketball than it was. And I'm going to go even farther back before Bruce got here. I think if you go back before that, Tennessee was just – a pretty decent basketball school. They'd get to the NCAA a few years. They'd miss it a few years. Now I think you're looking at it more as you're not one of the blue bloods, but you're kind of in that tier where, okay, this is a good, solid place. I can go there, and we can have a lot of success. And you can recruit, too, because yeah. uh -huh. he's elevated that for sure at Tennessee. Who's longer at their, at their jobs? Is it Pearl at Auburn or Barnes at Tennessee? I mean, I, that's, that's kind of a close call. I, I do think that Pearl elevated the job as well. No, no it didn't end sure, well. Sure. Right. But he showed what could happen. And then Tennessee yeah. made a couple of hiring mistakes. But, but I, and then I think that, that Barnes has actually taken it to a longer, more consistent high level. Well, I thought you were talking about Pearl at Auburn. Pearl's done the same thing at Auburn. I mean, when yeah, we were playing, yes. we used to play right. Auburn. I mean, there was the moms and dads were, and the girlfriends were in the stands, and that was about <laughs> it. And now that place is rocking. They went to a Final Four. I mean, both, both coaches have, have changed the trajectory of these There programs. was no jungle when you went down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we, well, that says something about Pearl, Barnes. They've, changed, they've made going to a Tennessee basketball game a thing. Yes. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. They've, they've made that arena into what I never really liked it when they first built Thompson Bowling. But now you go over there, it's a fun place to be, and it, and it looks good. So I think mm -hmm. all of that makes Tennessee a better program going forward. Yeah, both places were ones that fans would avoid at times. Now they make appointments to be there, including this week, this Wednesday, with Bruce Pearl and Auburn coming to town. 
Rick Barnes versus Bruce Pearl. What will Bruce Pearl try to do on the offensive end, on the defensive end against Tennessee's team? Why don't we ask Bruce Pearl's former player and assistant coach next. Welcome back into The Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Southeast Termite and Pest Control. Spring is almost here, and that means it's time to start planning for mosquitoes and carpenter bees. And you can call Southeast Termite and Pest Control this week to discuss their treatment options. Since 1971, go to southeasttermite.com. Tennessee gets ready for a big game and a big week. Here's where, here's where things stand right now. These are projections, of course. The next two weeks will play a big role, but the Bracketology Report, looking at Joe Lenardi of ESPN and Jerry Palm of CBS Sports. Both have Tennessee as a two seed. Uh, you see Quinnipiac and Colgate as a potential first round matchup, starting out in either Indianapolis or Memphis. Tennessee is close. A lot of the ESPN broadcasts on Saturday night was about Tennessee's chances to get a one seed. Again, these next two weeks will play a big role in that. So let's take a look at where things are in the SEC, as Tennessee is tied atop the SEC standings with the head-to-head -head tiebreaker right now for seeding, but Tennessee still has a game to go at Alabama. Auburn, Alabama, South Carolina, Kentucky coming up. Ole Miss, Tennessee, Florida, and Arkansas is the schedule for Alabama. So remove the head-to-head -head matchup. Mark Pankerts, I would say that the advantage schedule-wise is to Alabama, and then Auburn is one game behind Alabama and Auburn right now in the SEC standing. So as you look, Mark, at the standings, the schedules over the final two weeks, does anything stand out about what you see for Tennessee or the opponents Tennessee is trying to beat out? Well, yeah, Tennessee definitely has the hardest slate down the stretch. Um, I like Auburn's. Uh, Auburn seems to be the easiest stretch uh, that I see there. Um, and then even, in, even Kentucky, you know, they're, they're at Mississippi State, but they've got – two snoozers at, at, uh, at home, and then this one coming up at in, in Knoxville against Tennessee. They'll get their shot against the balls. Be yeah. for you know, the conference championship. So that is a look at the SEC standings, our focus back to Tennessee and Auburn. What do you think Bruce Pearl will try to do? We'll start out on the offensive side, attacking Tennessee's defense, which has been a strength over the course of the season. But as we talked about, Auburn's top 15 offense and defense this year. Offensively, what does Auburn try to do this week? Ball screens. I mean, I, they're they're going to ball screen a ton and, and even add some action. Some coaches call it uh, the, the the sweep action to where they're, they're running up, acting like they're going to set a ball screen, but then they they, they slip it, they en enter it uh, or exit it before there's actual screen because they're going to drive us downhill. Um, they, they score almost 50% of their points in the paint. So um, they're, they're going to attack downhill with, with Broom, uh, getting the ball inside to him um, and, and those ball screens. We've got to defend the ball screens. Uh, with Adu and, and, and Tobey. And avoid foul trouble, I imagine. Yeah, because of our depth. I mean, they, they've got incredible depth. And if we're going to do some ball screen actions, or they're going to do ball screen actions with Josiah, or basically we're going to do a lot of switching in that, in that instances. And so we got to be able to keep guys uh, out of foul trouble. How about Auburn on the defensive end? Like Tennessee, a top five defensive efficiency team, what do they try to do against Tennessee? There's no doubt Barnes or uh, Pearl's talking to them about their guards, about toughness about being able to, to bring the heat back to Tennessee. We're known for our toughness and how we get through screens and how we defend ball screens and really try to blow things up. Auburn's going to try to do the same thing in the half court. And then the full court, again, they're going to try to wear down Zakai, ball pressure him, make somebody else bring the ball up the floor, and, and disrupt our offense and the flow of our offense. When our offense is not stationary and we're moving, we're a good offensive team. But when we get out there and just – pound the ball up top because now maybe Ganey or Connect or somebody else is initiating the offense besides Ziegler, our offense gets, gets more stagnant. Is that where Connect, his ability to help from a full court standpoint, handling the basketball, is that where he can be even more helpful than the typical conversation of his ability to score? It is, but you know, Connect can make the, the easier assist out to the perimeter. He's not as good at the interior assist like Zakai is, so they're going to be able to gap Connect as he drives it. And that's why you need Ganey, Meshack, Vescovy, Josiah, be a really good standstill shooter and knock down some open shots. Because when Connect drives it, he's most likely going to kick it out to the perimeter and, and create some open opportunities for those guys. Last thing, Auburn at home at Alabama. It's a big test. will play a big role in the SEC standings. Again, NCAA tournament, chances of a 2-0 week for Tennessee. What do you think? 
I'm always going to say there's a chance, but 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 I think they'll go one and one. Okay. I think you'll end up winning this game um, and here in in Knoxville, and then going to Alabama and that environment, the what the way that we whooped them here in Knoxville, uh, the loss that they had last night, Alabama did. I think they'll be ready to go, and it'll be a tough one to get. Mark Pankratz, great insight and information today as always. Thanks for being here. We'll let you go. You have your own coaching to do. That's right. The rest yep. of the day. Mark, good to see you as always. Thanks, Josh. When we come back here on the Sports Source, we move from one court to another. We have a verdict. What does it mean for Tennessee? That, when we come back. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Madisonville Marine. The Downtown Knoxville Boat Show is coming up February 29th through March 3rd. That's Thursday through Sunday, and they will have 30, I'll repeat it, 30 boats on display. Great promotions and incentives. You can stop by and see Madisonville Marine at the Convention Center starting Thursday. Did you hear that, Bob Hodge? 30 boats. <laughs> how many boats? 30 boats. I'm trying to figure out how many of those I could finance. <laughs> <laughs> Between now and Thursday, time to figure it out. Uh, it took a little bit more time maybe than Tennessee fans wanted, but they got the word that they wanted Friday afternoon. Judge Clifton Corker, uh, with his decision on Friday afternoon, with a preliminary injunction that prohibits the NCAA from punishing athletes or boosters for negotiating name, image, and likeness deals during their recruiting process or players in the transfer portal. It's not a final ruling, but it's a big win for Tennessee and will provide a big statement on the future. We'll get to the future of college sports. How about for Tennessee? Will West, you were on the radio Friday afternoon when this ruling comes down. Your reaction, a couple of days to think about it. What does this mean for Tennessee? I, I honestly expected this. Everyone that we'd spoken to in the legal field said that they expected this to happen when the NCAA made their argument. It's weird that this was about their ability to police NIL, and then the NCAA's argument is, mm -hmm. uh, no, student-athletes can't negotiate with the NIL collective. They just have to sign a contract without knowing how much money they're going to be paid. That wasn't going to fly. It was weird to me that that's the kind of route the NCAA went with that. That was the argument that you made. And especially when the judge did press the NCAA's attorneys on that, then and, and the NCAA really didn't have an answer. I expected this. I thought it might come a little more quickly. I do understand the judge's point of view, though, that, hey, you're just pretty much scrapping everything as far as the NCAA's ability to police NIL, mm -hmm. not just for Tennessee, but nationwide. So I understand it took a while, but this is the outcome I think we all expected. Doesn't this make it harder for the NCAA to punish Tennessee? Yeah. If you have ruled that it's okay to negotiate deals ahead of time, unless, unless there's some allegations against Tennessee I don't know about. But if that's all it is, it, what they're aiming for, I don't know how they can push, punish Tennessee or any other schools that have been doing, like the other 120, that have been doing the same thing that Tennessee's doing, and that is negotiating deals for them to come to your school. So uh, now, is there a judge out there in some other state that might come in and overrule this? I guess it's possible. I don't see that. So I think it's a huge win for Tennessee. And to me, it indicates strongly that Tennessee is not going to be punished by the NCAA. Yeah, Tennessee not the only school that the NCAA has been looking into mm -hmm. or sending letters to, but Tennessee was the one resp that responded Vince, with Donnie Plowman's letter. There are a lot of responses. And then, of course, the attorney general right here. Yeah, and you could tell the way Tennessee operated, the state of Tennessee and the University of Tennessee, that they were confident that they would get this outcome, as Will said, that I think a lot of us expected. And, um, you know, the, the NCAA is dealing with so many different things, and this sets them back in a huge way to try to say that they're on their last leg, seemingly, and this kind of clips that last leg away. And I, I agree with Jimmy. I, I think the the way that there was a notice of allegations, it was a report about an investigation. I don't know how they move forward with this ruling. And, and we're going to talk about how this impacts NCAA le later. Mm -hmm. But as, as far as the University of Tennessee goes, you know, I think that Tennessee jumped out in front of NIL. I mean, there were stories about it nationwide. We know about what was reported in The Athletic, and then it came out, Nico, all this stuff. And so I wonder how much of this just goes back to that because, as Will said, you're bringing an investigation of, of what? You're, you're doing what? And I just sort of think that Tennessee was loud and they were proud and they, got, they were the <laughs> biggest NIL thing going there for just a little while. 
And so I wondered if the NCAA just said, okay, this is where we're going to go because these people have talked about it. And maybe the impact on Tennessee, I think, which is overall incredibly positive that you got this injunction, but it is also just that the NCAA was, okay, we've got to put a stake in the ground someplace. So we might as well just do it here. I think Spire Sports hurt that a little bit. When they came out and started bragging about all the money we exactly. got, we, you want the best cars, you come here. You want the best apartments, you come here. And Even said the best tires. The best, <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think that brought some focus to it. And one reason I'm convinced about it, if, if they didn't feel that way, then why did Tennessee tell Spire, cool it? And I know for a fact they did. Quit going out there boasting about right. it. Let's just kind of go undercover here a little bit with this stuff. Even though we think it's okay, you don't need to go bragging about it. You're bringing too much attention. And I think that is what led well, It's kind of the old like opposite of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You were the squeaky wheel, so you got the, the investigation. But, right. but I do think moving forward for Tennessee, I'll be surprised if there ever is a notice of allegations given to Tennessee mm -hmm. on this one. I think the NCAA leaks their ones and walks away. I think they wanted a couple of quick hits, like with Florida State, where – Slap on the hand, you have two years probation, we look like, it's like security theater, right? We look like right. we're actually doing something about what's happening in the, in the NIL world right now when we're actually not. And I don't think they do anything towards Tennessee or come after them at all. I really don't. And, and well, I agree. I think that's the biggest reason why Tennessee was the target. Maybe not because they were, you know, boisterous. I think it's because that's how they could send a statement that would resonate to the rest of college athletics because of their success in the NIL space. So if you go after Western Kentucky, you're not going to send that same message. But you do against Tennessee, it, it may be a dream world that they thought that, but I think that's a big reason well, why they did Florida State so. took their lumps, right? Florida right. State took it. Right. Tennessee didn't. Right. Florida, we still don't even know. I wonder if that'll go retroactive. Yeah. Now, what Florida State <laughs> did was different from Tennessee because they had a coach that actually drove, drove a prospect the yeah, to the collective. Yeah. Okay. You should know better than that. No. That's not very smart. But Some loose buttons on that one. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So that, that's different from what Tennessee did. There's no evidence that Tennessee did that. So it, it, I'll be curious to see where it goes, but I, I, do, I do wonder, one, if Florida State gets uh, cleared of that, but I also don't think any punishments coming to Tennessee or any other schools that have been engaged in the same conduct as Tennessee. Does this uh, add to the confidence from Tennessee fan base or people around UT in the leadership? of the school, Donnie Plowman, Randy Boyd, Danny White, with how they handled this? Yes, because they won. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so yeah, I, I do. And I think, I think Donnie Plowman has actually had a lot of support anyway. And mm -hmm. I, I think she's done a really good job as the chancellor. And, and Danny White's record, it, he, he's done a very good job as well. I mean, they've won two straight all sports trophies. So he's doing what he's supposed to in that role. So I think there's a lot of confidence from the Tennessee fan base toward the administration. And in fact, it may be the most confidence I've seen since going back to Joe Johnson and Doug Dickey. I think it goes back that far. It doesn't it seem like a little bit like it's like fight the power too, right? Because for most fans, I think they look at the NCAA, they don't look at it as the NCAA is the member institutions, right? Tennessee <laughs> is the NCAA. Yeah, they they look don't at look at it that the way. The opposition. Yeah, they look mm -hmm. at it as the opposition or yeah. an unfair policing arm like mm -hmm. the IRS or something like that of college that. athletics, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And the fans will rally around that. We Absolutely. Have seen, we have seen. So the impact on Tennessee, good news for Tennessee. It seems when we come back, what about the future of college sports, the NCAA? What's the impact there? That's next. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Daniel Hood Roofing. Are your shingles older than they should be? The extremes in weather here in East Tennessee can do serious damage to your shingles. High heat, bitter cold, then more rain than Seattle for good measure. It all takes a toll. Don't wait till you see a stain on your ceiling. Call Daniel Hood Roofing today to set up a 100% free inspection. That's Daniel Hood Roofing. So Tennessee gets the win on Friday, and it's an ongoing case still, but a big win for Tennessee, it seems. Tennessee is able to take a step back from NCAA concerns right now. But what about the future of the NCAA, the future of college sports. This will have some kind of impact. Jimmy Himes, what do you think the future of college sports with the latest ruling that went against the NCAA? I think that in football, you're going to have a separation from the current status. Not necessarily a divorce from the NCAA, but I think you, and I don't think it's just the SEC and the Big Ten. 
There, there are other programs out there, Clemson and the ACC and some others in the Big 12. I could see a powered league of 50 to 60 teams. They have their own governing rules, not un, but, they're, but they're not detached from the NCAA. They call their own shots. They vote on all their rules, and then the NCAA governs all the other sports. That's what I think is going to happen. I think that the toothpaste is out of the tube. They're never getting control of NIL back. I think that probably by the end of 2024, we get some level of a court or National Labor Relations Board or con congressional ruling that college athletes are employees. And when that happens, everything changes because then they can unionize, they can collectively bargain to, to determine what their compensation is going to be. And then we see what Jimmy's talking about. You'll see for football and maybe even big time college basketball, then break away from the NCAA because if they're employees, you have to pay them, you have to start maximizing revenue. Can the University of Tennessee really con continue to subsidize Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, Missouri, Alabama's not going to want to do that. Georgia's not going to want to do that. So I agree with Jimmy. That's where we're going. This is just the first domino on the way to that, in my opinion. What do you guys think? One of the, one of the things I read after the injunction came out was, will the NCAA, a lot of it had nothing to do with the University of Tennessee. It was big picture stuff, NCAA, what's going to happen there. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I read that had to do with Tennessee and the NCAA, okay, the NIL stuff seemingly now is off the table. NCAA has no leg to stand on. But this investigation supposedly encompassed more than just football and just NIL. So now will the NCAA hone in on doing this? And I thought, boy, if they do that, what an incredibly brilliantly stupid thing could they do? Because I think... This injunction has really hurt the NCAA going forward, and, it, and the direction it go could be exactly what Will said. You've got a football set up over here, and then everything else stays over on the other side. But I think if the NCAA takes this and, and looks at it as, okay, now, okay, Tennessee, you got away with this, but you're not going to get away with these other things, whatever they may possibly be, then I think you could see the NCAA totally imploding and going away as a – as an entity, you know, which, okay, how do you set up the March Madness basketball tournaments? How do you do this? How do you do that? It would leave a hole. But I think that the NCAA is teetering on not even being an organization anymore. Well, it, it's a mess one way or the other for the NCAA. They are on seemingly their last legs. What's interesting is when the SEC and Big Ten they sort of got together to discuss the landscape of college athletics, a.k.a. money, um, that they, they said, that Sankey said that, hey, we're not looking to separate or bury the NCAA. We want to work together what works best. So I wonder if, kind of to what Jimmy was saying, if they envision a plan that doesn't destroy them but maybe gives us what we want, our bigger piece of the pie. Because let's be honest, all this is about money, but I would imagine separating football from everything else is where they'll ultimately end up, whether they're employees or not. It, it, but it's in Charlie Baker trying to do Project D1 and things like that where, hey, all the athletes are going to make the same amount of money and you can pay up to this number of athletes and they thought 100 schools would do this. That showed that they were trying to move in that direction and they realized... It's different from what the NCAA has talked about. Absolutely. absolutely. So there really, I think there was at least an effort to move into that and then we get stupid things like... You can't give a cookie cake inside of a hotel room. It has to be given in the lounge and things like that. And those are the things, especially seeing what Greg Sankey did this week, of uh, the SEC is in discussions to have their own signing day. Uh, no, no, this is our signing day. And you're seeing Tony Batiti and Greg Sankey kind of let the NCAA know, we don't trust you, we're not waiting on you, and we'll go ahead and just run this thing ourselves. That's not something I would want if I was Charlie Baker. Money is always going to be the central figure, though. We have more topics that we'll cover money and how it's going to drive college football. But the NCAA future very much in question. There is no question uh, with Tennessee's assistant coaching positions. They were filled this past week. When we come back, who Josh Heupel has hired and the impact on Tennessee. That's next. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Safety Systems, East Tennessee's most trusted name in security systems for your home or business. VFL J.J. Surlis and his team have protected people's property all over the area for more than 20 years, from a simple doorbell camera to a super system designed specifically for your property. Turn to Safety Systems. 
Tennessee football coach Josh Heupel turned to running backs coach Darrell Sims to replace Jerry Mack. Sims will arrive from Cincinnati, and the Bearcats this past season were sixth in the country in rush offense, so a good season running the ball with Sims coaching the running backs. And then at the linebackers coach position, as Tennessee had to replace Brian John Marie, he moves to Michigan. The Vols have hired William Inge, who was the co-defense coordinator at Washington, appeared slated to go to Alabama, I think Tennessee fans like that. Hey, we took somebody from Alabama. But he comes from Washington to Tennessee after coaching in the national championship game. <clears throat> uh, Bob, thoughts on the hires? Darrell Sims coaching running backs. William Inge coming in to coach linebackers. The one that really caught my eye was Inge. Because if you look at his resume, I mean, that's a heck of a resume. Mm -hmm. The fact that you stopped him from going to Alabama, okay, yeah, that's a win. But, but his resume is long. It, it kind of gathered if you would have hired him as your defensive coordinator, you'd have gone, okay, that looks like a pretty solid hire. So getting him as your linebackers coach, um, I thought the interesting thing, you know, Sims, much thinner resume, much younger guy, but he has had success at the places he's been. You mentioned what he'd done at Cincinnati. Um, the, the one question I have about both of them, which hasn't been answered by any of the things, I've been out of town just reading what I could, is how are they as recruiters? Because I think that, that everything with UT's current coaching staff comes back to how good are these guys as recruiters? Do they help you there? I think as far as on the field, player development, they look like two really good hires. And once again, Inge looked like a fantastic hire. But are these guys recruiters, and how much are they going to help you there? But I think, I think obviously, Happel did a solid job. I think there's positives for both of them. I think there, there's questions about both of them to some degree as well. With Sims in terms of recruiting, he's recruited a lot of players in the state of Tennessee, Josh. You follow recruiting. A lot of guys have reacted to the hiring of Sims and said, that's my dog, and you know he's been great, really good with relationships. And he's been recruiting guys to Louisville and Cincinnati from the state of Tennessee. So that helps in terms of networking. With Inge, he hasn't, really had, he hasn't had a job in the southeast. So where are those relationships? Will they keep him more positional recruiting versus territorial recruiting the, until he kind of gets that networking built? So that would be the one question. But you know, listening to Inge and him mic'd up in press conferences, he's impressive, intelligent, mm -hmm. cerebral, sounds like a defensive coordinator, yeah. which he was at Washington. And Sims has had an upward trajectory, trajectory in his gig. So I think there's plenty of positives there, plus energy as well. Yeah, Sims a younger guy. Uh, with the changes we just talked about in college sports, you need a coach that understands how things are changing. And uh, I think they hope that he is going to be that kind of coach uh, from a recruiting standpoint or coaching. Guys, what do you think about the two hires? Well, I, I, I think they're both great from a coaching standpoint. I think both of these guys seem to be able to develop their position group very well and to be really smart guys that can coach. I do could get concerned that Tennessee doesn't have enough recruiters on this staff, and it can be hard if you're Josh Heupel. I mean, you don't want to go full Rob Niedermeyer, where a guy can't coach his way up a wet paper bag, but he can get you players, right, with bagfuls of money. But he allegedly. can carry a paper bag. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to go fully that route, but I am concerned that with Tennessee's current, current staff right now, who are the recruiters, right? That, that's the one thing that I have to concern with with this group of guys right now. Sims has to be a good recruiter. Mm -hmm. At that position – uh, look, we could be a good running back coach if we had Jamal Lewis, Travis Stevens, and Travis Henry, right? But he has to be a really good recruiter. He, he spent a year at Carson Newman, by the way, which probably doesn't have anything to do with him getting hired. So I, I think that's important, imperative for him. Uh, with Inge, I, I, you need to have a good recruiter there, but you also have to be a, a, better, a, a good coach and a player developer there. I think it's more important because there's more responsibility from a linebacker position in coaching how to do things than there is a running back. So... Would, it would help if both of them are great recruiters, but your running backs coach mm -hmm. needs to be really good. We'll find out how good Sims is. Yeah, both position groups have young players, second-year players, that they're hoping will make a big jump. Arion Carter and Jeremiah T. Lander at linebacker, mm -hmm. and then at running back, they have to replace two key guys from yep. last season. So uh, Cameron Selden learning the position. Vince, what kind of jump can he make? Khalifa Keith and then Peyton Lewis is a, a freshman that will have a chance to play too. Yeah, not a big group, but talent. There's four-star guys in that room in different classes. So I think that's definitely a positive. And, um, you know, he has the proven productivity, does Sims, in working with those guys. So I imagine maybe even some of them he re did recruit uh, as well as part of the process. So I, I, think, I think Sims will – from a coaching standpoint, will fit in smoothly. And then 
Inge as well. That, that's a Tim Banks hire. Let's let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Tim Banks yeah. wanted someone that can fit what he's do what what he does, and that's a really veteran. That's another fifty plus year old coach on that staff. Mm -hmm. I was I was just going to say as far as the, as the coaches and the recruiting, which is also my big question. But the one thing that I've liked about Hypel in the years he's been here, they do develop guys. Mm -hmm. And, and okay, if you're not great recruiters, but you are getting the max out of what you get on campus, you can't undersell that because his predecessor, they brought in better players, and they didn't seem like they could develop anybody. So there is something to be said for, yeah, they're good coaches, they're not great recruiters, okay. That, that's not the worst thing in the world. And Tennessee finishes outside the top ten in the recruiting rankings this year, but they do finish in the blue chip ratio. And so as we get closer and closer to that, and you can get in the blue chip ratio and you have developers of talent, I think that you can still have a whole lot of success, especially in a 12-team playoff where it's not just right. beauty pageant, did you make the top four, you're in, you're out. Well, the other part of that is it'd be helpful if you're good recruiting out of the portal. As right. well. And maybe there's some contacts there that could help you. Inge might have some West Coast contacts mm -hmm. that could help with players you're trying to bring in, whether we're talking yeah. about this upcoming spring or even looking a year from now. And to Bob's point, the better you develop, the more you do have to sell yeah. on the recruiting. And with the win over the NCAA, <laughs> how does the recruiting go? I mean, better tires are back on the table. Yeah, and, and I, don't, I don't think there were concerns the last couple of weeks with, with the news out. I don't right. think there were big concerns among recruits. But this helps yeah. Yeah. that you have this win yeah. from the court case on Friday. Well, you're, you're talking about what the coaches have in terms of talent at those two positions. It helps in is that he's got Keenan Peely. Mm -hmm. You know, to be another yeah. coach on the field, that's yeah. going to help with the transition in a lot of ways in that room. When we come back here on the Sports Source, speaking of the 12-team format, it's out. There also could be an even bigger playoff format to talk about in the future. We'll give you details next. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by Games and Things. We are just a few weeks away from March Madness, conference tournaments, the NCAA tournament, then baseball and golf and NASCAR. Sports fans make your sports viewing all the better by visiting Games and Things and picking out some new home theater seats. No one in East Tennessee has a better selection, so go check out Games and Things. Guys, we have a new 5-7 college football playoff format that has been set. 5 plus 7 format means 5 conference champs, 7 at-large bids for the playoff as they move to 12 teams this upcoming year. The top 4 ranked conference champs will be seeded 1 through 4. So they get the 4 buys. So you can go 10-3, and 9-4 and four even if you're a conference champ somehow from one of the other conference. You'll still be one of the top 4 seeds and get a first round buy. There is no max amount of spots for one conference in the 12-team playoff. Will, what do you think? With the format that came out officially, five plus seven, five conference champs getting the automatic spots and the top four spots going to the four highest-ranked conference champs. Yeah, I, I love the, the highest-ranked aspect of that because, I mean, if you see a 9-3 and three Baylor win the Big 12 title game versus a 10-2 and two, uh, Utah, will, will they really be ranked above? You might see two group of five teams that have an opportunity to get in and maybe even and getting buys because of that. So I think that's kind of cool. I also think this is a two-year placeholder, and we'll move on to something else by the time we get to 2026. Mm -hmm. Yep, that so, is part of the talk. But for right now, I think it's, it's pretty good, and I like the way that they went about it, making it about who's ranked the highest, not just automatically giving the bids to these certain conferences regardless of their record. What does it mean for Tennessee and the SEC overall when you see this format as it came out? It opens the door to get one or two more teams in the playoff. And Tennessee could very easily be one of those. They would have been one of those two years ago when they won 11 games mm -hmm. and then beat Clemson in the Orange Bowl. So it, it opens uh, uh, the door a little bit more for Tennessee to get in. Let's face it, it's going to be hard for Tennessee right now to, to jump Georgia in particular, maybe even Alabama too, at this point. So I think it helps Tennessee a lot in that regard. And I would bet you that the Big Ten and the SEC are going to take the majority of those at-large spots. Vince? I think it's positive for Tennessee and the SEC. Look, the SEC is going to have a lot of teams regardless of the format. Like, you can put together whatever you want. The SEC is going to have a bunch of teams. They're in the Big Ten with their improvement. It, that's going to be the case as well. So the, we wouldn't have a Tennessee college football playoff realistically if it was four teams. But now yeah. that it's 12, you, you, you can't poo-poo that if somebody brings that to the table. So it, it, it is helpful. 
I think I looked at that and I thought, if you go ten and two in the SEC, you're in. Mm-hmm. You know, so so in any given year, depending on how the schedule falls, this, that, and the other. I mean, could you see t- the the SEC taking? You know, obviously, I think three spots of the twelve. I think will be kind of neat. Could they take four spots out of the twelve? Sure. Yeah, I think they probably could, depending on how the schedule fell. So, so to me, if if I'm Tennessee going forward, as much as I want to win the SEC championship, hey, let's let's get to ten and two, because mm-hmm. I think if you get that, then you're playing for a national title. And, and I'm, I don't think that the committee is going to punish the SEC for playing an eight game schedule right now. I, I think those teams that think they're a potential playoff team, you better make sure your non conference schedule is up to snuff. So right. then you, you grade the overall strength of schedule. If you're Georgia and you're 10-2, and two, but you've played Georgia Tech, Ohio State, and Southern Cal, well, I don't care that you only played eight conference games. But if you played a bunch of cupcakes, you're 10-2, and two, Michigan's 10-2, and two, Michigan's got a better chance of getting in. Well, so you, what you do on conference-wise schedule is going to impact this. And, and I get concerned, though, that once we go to the – we're already talking about doing stupid things. Because I don't love the idea of – 8, 16, this seems pretty easy to me. Why did we go 12 and have buys? It doesn't make sense. They're already talking about a 14-team playoff. And and instead of doing it exactly like the NFL does, which sets record numbers and pulls in a ton of revenue, no, 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 four teams get a buy, four from the SEC, four from the Big Ten, and then, and then everybody else kind of figures it out. I have a concern that this is a two-year placeholder and then we're going to do something a little weird instead of just doing the thing that works already. Yeah, Bill Hancock from the playoff committee confirmed this week that they did discuss a 14-team playoff, which could begin in 2026. And those power conferences, the Big Ten and the SEC, want more automatic qualifiers, Yeah, which sucks. No. I mean, so if you're the best, why do you have to get an automatic spot? So it, Guaranteed it, four is right. what they asked for? Yeah. yeah. But I'm like, well, why don't you just go to 16? Yeah. I, I mean, why not? I thought they should have, before they went to 12, I thought they should have gone to 16. And now you're talking about going to 14, probably on your way to 16? No, don't. don't. Just go ahead and go to 16. Yeah. Or do what the NFL does. Two teams get a bye and work it out from there. Well, that's why the 14, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. that you'd have a bye for a couple of teams. Yeah, but they're saying but four teams will get a bye. Go to, go to 16. Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't like that. Well, 2028, they can go to 16 now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to your, to your placeholder. Do you guys have a sweet spot? Would it be a lower number? Would it be up to 16? Do you have a sweet spot for what the perfect playoff number would be? Hey, for me, There's obviously no going 16. back, by the way. I thought the FCS uh, playoff was perfect yeah. at 16. It was, it was wild. It was awesome. It was at, at uh, school sites. So I loved the six. I thought 16 was the perfect I'm in number. favor of 16. I understand trying to give a bye to maybe the two best teams or whatever, but mm-hmm. I like 16. That's a good round number. I'm, I'm a 16 guy, too. Uh, I, I fought that forever. Go to 16. People say, well, the 16 best team, best team doesn't have a chance. Probably not. But still, it, it just makes the math work, and I'm horrible at it. Hey, that. New York Giants didn't have a chance against the Patriots. <laughs> That's right, exactly. And we, saying that while John's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, uh, I'm reluctant on 16. I, it may work out. I, I, would say, I would say 12 is okay for right now. I know it's not going to stay there. But this theory that, oh, you, we had blowouts in the semifinals before. Now you're going to expand it. We're going to have even more blocks. No, you're going to have closer, more competitive games because you have a lot of teams that yeah. are similar in their ability. There was even some, why don't we just go back to the BCS talk this week. That's one thing I can guarantee is not going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? Good. Money again becomes the yeah. answer. I don't want to clutch in my car either. So. <laughs> <laughs> when we come back here on the Sports Source, Tennessee versus Auburn, Bruce Pearl versus Rick Barnes, we have a Cavalaris line. We'll come back and discuss. Welcome back into the Sports Source. This segment is brought to you by English Mountain Spring Water. You see us drinking it on set each week. It has been voted the best tasting water in the world, and it comes from a crystal clear spring located thousands of feet below English Mountain in Dandridge. That's right here in East Tennessee. Visit EnglishMountainH2O.com to learn how to sample it and how to have it delivered to your home or office. Tennessee gets ready to host Auburn on Wednesday, and we cannot have a Tennessee-Auburn, Rick Barnes, Bruce Pearl conversation without the Cavalaris line. He has set the line at five and a half points, Tennessee favorite at home in this game. Vince Ferrari, you hear the line, five and a half points, Tennessee the favorite. 
What do you think? Which direction would you go with this one? How can I Cavalaris? The Cavalaris <laughs> line. Um, no, I would actually go Auburn's way with the line. I think Tennessee is going to win. I know we were talking, you were talking about it earlier, how close games would be difficult for Tennessee, and, and Auburn wins a lot of those close games because of their depth. I just think this is going to be one of those kind of rare, down-to-the-wire close games, and I think Tennessee will be on top. So I would, would go uh, Auburn's direction with that line. Bob, which way would you go? I'm going to go with Tennessee. I really think that uh, I, I really think Tennessee will play well in this game. It seems like when Tennessee is focused, and this is a game that they will focus on, that they look like a Final Four, maybe one of the top two or three teams in the country. And I just think that they will focus in on this game. I think Auburn's depth is what's probably going to keep the the score from getting it, it's not going to be what we saw Saturday with uh, Texas A&M. But I, I like, you know, Tennessee five and a half points. Yeah, I like Tennessee five and a half points. Yeah, I think Tennessee covers as well. Part of it is that when good teams lose on the road in the SEC, they really get their money's <laughs> worth and just get crushed, yeah. right? So that's one of the reasons why I'll take Tennessee to win this one. I think it might even be an 11 or 15 point game. Because it just seems like it's always double digits when ranked teams lose in the SEC this year. Tennessee's on a, what, 35-point-per-game streak at home, Jimmy? <laughs> yes, last, last Vanderbilt year. and a yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't know um, if it's going to be that, but what do you think here? Uh, Bruce Pearl has won seven of the last nine against Rick Barnes head-to-head. So he's pretty much had his number. But having said that, the only home game I can remember where Tennessee laid an egg was South Carolina, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and Tennessee beat Ole Miss 90-64. to 64. They beat Alabama by 20. I'm going to take Tennessee in five and a half. I know that's dangerous because Pearl really gets his team juiced up to play Tennessee. Mm-hmm. But I think Tennessee at home is so good. And when they're focused, and they are, I don't think they were focused against South Carolina. They'll be focused in this game. I think Tennessee will cover. Is Bruce Pearl the top rival to Tennessee right now? You have the history, of course. Uh, they're both competing near the top of the SEC. Where would you put that, Vince? That conversation. I I would still think Kentucky is, you know, just because of the brand and the history there. Yes, Pearl adds serious juice to it. And and I understand it's kind of like with the Florida Alabama football discussion. I I would still say fans want the Kentucky win more than beating Pearl. You know, that that is a hard one because both of those games, obviously, Bruce Pearl has elevated Auburn. If, if he was at Missouri, he would have elevated Missouri in the Tennessee rivalry thing. I kind of think with Tennessee being as good as they are, it elevates it a little bit more because here's our former coach that for, you know, fan, fans really loved him. NCAA didn't seem to care for him a whole lot. But the fans loved him, and now he's the rival. This, that, you know, I, I think – with them both being good, with them both being NCAA tournament teams, with this being a game that can have the lead to what happens with the SEC regular season race. I think it's elevated it maybe not every year, but I think for this year, for this game, for this time, yeah, I will say that Bruce is, is the top rival. I think they should be, but they're not because Auburn's so far away. It's not like you're ever talking trash with Auburn basketball fans online, right? That's not happening. And I think most Tennessee fans still kind of appreciate what Bruce did for the Tennessee yeah. basketball program. So it should be, but I think it's Kentucky, not Auburn. It's a, it's a torn rivalry. Yeah. But, I, but, I, th- many but I think that's what, what elevates it a little bit is because people do like it. Yeah. You know, but if you were playing your brother and pick up basketball out in your driveway, you go harder. who do you want to beat worse than anybody yeah. else? You want to beat your brother. And Tennessee wants to beat Auburn this week. Hey, guys, thank I, you for being here. I'm going to say Kentucky because with Kentucky's Pearl, there are some people that still like Pearl. Nobody yeah. around here likes Kentucky. Thank you for being with us today. John Pennington is back next Sunday. You can be thankful for that. Thank you for being with us.